to make it, you got to bust your black ass. You got to be re re relentless. You got to persevere. You got to be focused. And you got to believe in what you do, what you have. And you have to work on your craft, whatever it is. You got to work on it. Okay, so the idea of a black cinema is a complex, convoluted, and, of course, incredibly important one. The cinema was, and continues to be, most often a representation of white personhood writ large. And yet, pioneers of black cinema have existed since nearly the invention of the motion picture itself. In 1916, Noble Johnson founded the first African-American production company, Lincoln Motion Picture, and he did it with his brother, George Perry Johnson. An actor himself, Noble's company produced race pictures. These challenged the stereotypes and tropes that existed in the roles for black actors at the time. The company lasted until about 1923, eventually folding due to high production expenses and low sales. The Heart of the Negro would be its last production. As the Johnsons paved the way for the possibility of independent black film production, other independent producers such as Oscar Micheaux soon joined the game. Micheaux managed to make 40 films. 40 films between 1919 and 1948, and he was the first African American to direct a sound film. It's a pretty big deal. I got a suspicion. Yeah? Yes. Now listen. Lincoln may have beaten Michaud to being the first black filmmaker controlled studio, but Michaud is often considered the first major African American filmmaker in general. He too produced race pictures that provoked response and discussion. A major figure in his time, his second picture, Within Our Gates, produced in 1920, is widely considered a response to D.W. Griffith's hugely successful and hugely racist, The Birth of a Nation, which is also the film where the Ku Klux Klan are the heroes that come to save the day, so yeah, not cute. As such, these early filmmakers did not make films simply for entertainment alone. Elois King Patrick Gist produced films with her husband to inspire morality, including the 1930s feature Hellbound Train. And according to a new essay by Amy Dixon, the great African-American novelist Zora Neale Hurston may have been the first African-American woman filmmaker with works such as 1928's Children's Games, the result of her work as an anthropology student. And now while these early pioneers of cinema worked hard to create honest and empathetic representations of black characters, the mainstream white cinema, well, told a different story. At first, characters of color were relegated to background or clownish characters. As the black population rose and had dollars to speak with, some black-facing cinema surfaced, but much of this had white minds still behind it. When fighting in World War II ramped up and it was clear that African-American soldiers would be required, the government asked Hollywood to increase the visibility of blacks in movies. Interestingly, this request was not only so that black Americans would feel included in the America they were about to fight for. No, it was also so that whites would get used to seeing black men in jobs that before they had no access to. So rather than being a complete opening of new roles and character types for black actors, this request came with guidelines from army researchers. Avoid stereotypes such as affinity for watermelon or pork. Show colored officers in command of troops, but don't play it up too much. Play down colored soldiers most negroid in appearance. Ugh. And omit all references to Lincoln, emancipation, or any race leaders or friends of the Negro. Reports Mark Harris in his book, Five Came Back, a story of Hollywood and the Second World War. Okay, so gross language aside, while the intent may have been primarily to acclimate white citizens to real life interactions with their black neighbors, this White House initiative also aided in challenging and evolving Hollywood's perception of the black character. Moving on from the stereotypical man-children, such as those oft-portrayed by the famous Step and Fetch It. This was all brought upon by the Office of War Information, a committee formed in World War II that essentially turned Hollywood filmmaking into a propaganda machine. This is why Hollywood was, and continues to be, a very pro-army, pro-police force, and generally war-friendly machine. While black folk were seeing themselves in ordinary roles for the first time, men were being encouraged to join the war effort and take on dutiful government responsibilities. Thus, a generation of kids who wanted to be cops and firefighters was born. As we'll see later, black citizens were more likely to side with the other side of the blue line raised on these same films, which perhaps is not so surprising. Meanwhile, in France, a group of African students made Afrique sur Seine in 1956, while Paris was still the capital of the French colonial empire. 
The documentary depicts the first congress of black writers and artists in Paris. Meanwhile, in Senegal, the godfather of African cinema, as it's called, Ousmane Sembin appeared on the scene in 1963 with his short Barome Sarret, and would break through to the worldwide market in 1966's La Noire de, or Black Girl. In 1970, Mauritanian-born French filmmaker Med Hondo made his directorial debut with Soleo, which won the Golden Leopard Award at the 1970 Locarno International Film Festival. His 1979 film, West Indies, would be the first African musical. Cassie Quarles, a documentarian, claims that the history of black British film only goes back to 1976. Horace Ove's Pressure is literally the first black British film ever made, which is really not that long ago. Back in America, the wartime guideline for inclusion, not surprisingly, did not usher in an era of new black American experience in the cinema. Black cinema would sometimes subside and then pop up in a new era. During the 1970s, for example, the works of Melvin Van Peebles and Gordon Parks were some highlights in what mostly became co-opted exploitation pictures. Yes. Well, the early days of, of racism uh, only made me work all that much more to prove to the rest of the world that I could do this or I could do that. But much like the white Americans being groomed for the military and police force, African Americans were also molded by the very entertainment they were excluded from. Art, and film specifically, play an important part in our everyday growth and lives. This presents an interesting dilemma. For what is there for you to learn if you're not represented in the very fabric that in a large part creates the culture? A large section of features made by black filmmakers in the 1990s find characters surrounding televisions, often watching gangster pictures. While these heroes may have Caucasian skin, their plight with the law and their quest to rise from submission against a crooked system to victory was something many non-Caucasian Americans could relate to. And with little else in arts and popular culture they could call their own, this they did. And so in the 1990s, American cinema exploded with new visions from black artists. Ernest Dickerson's Juice in 1992 plays almost as a frightening investigation into this dynamic. Storyline is like this. Four young black males, tight like glue. Now we want to see what happens when these four black males try to grow up and we all go in different directions. Following four Harlem teenagers, Dickerson creates an urban landscape of rambling, disaffected, nearly all non-white youth. In a chilling scene of premonition, characters sit in front of the television watching White Heat and quoting the film. They already equate themselves with the criminal underworld, even before committing any crime other than being born black. The rise of hip-hop music in the 1980s created not only an alternate and powerful cultural identity for the usually male African-American individual, but also revealed an entire new market and customer. African-American made art for the African-American consumer. In essence, Juice plays out as an analytical investigation into this new identity. The music is a powerful signifier, often packaged in gangster rap format. One character, Q, follows the music, while the other, Bishop, follows the image it presents. Ernest Dickerson, the director of Juice, is best known for his collaborations as director of photography with Spike Lee. Ah, Spike Lee. He shot Lee's trailblazing Do the Right Thing in 1989. Juice shares with Lee's early pictures an affinity for exaggerated performances and natural production design. What I like about the title is that everyone has their own interpretation of what is the right thing. Not only in the audience, but the characters in the film too. And that was really what we wanted to try to do with that film, to really spark discussion, exchange of ideals, debate about race. While Lee's incendiary cinema paved the way, both artistic and economic, for the next generation of black artists to examine contemporary urban life, Lee spent the early 90s expanding the possibility of black cinema to tell greater and grander stories. He remained outside of the crime picture until 1996's Clockers. Interestingly enough, this Spike Lee joint was almost a Martin Scorsese picture, authored by white novelist Richard Price. Scorsese, attached to the Price script as a director, sought in something more suited for Lee. It continues Lee's investigation into morality, in all of its shades of gray. Perhaps Harvey and John, as detectives, have a slight margin on being the good guys in this picture, but not by much. They are casually racist, manipulative, and eat and joke over some of the most viciously rendered dead bodies seen in cinema. 
The shocking opening of Clockers, with its crime scene images of dead black bodies, plays as a hard-to-swallow follow-up project to Colleen Smith's Dry Long So in 1998, in which a young woman takes on the project of photographing young black males because, as she sees it, she's quote, taking pictures of black men because they are becoming an endangered species. Wow. One out of every four black men is currently involved in the penal system. I'm capturing and preserving their image, some kind of evidence of existence. If these white cops and clockers are the heroes, it might simply be because the film takes place in hell, which is to say, you know, modern Brooklyn. Lee and cinematographer Malik Hassan Saeed shoot the film in blazing colors on a high contrast film stock that can hardly hold the grain together. The colors shock, dilute, and never, ever comfort. In the end, Lee, as with many other filmmakers of the time, seems to suggest the only hope is through escape. Charles Burnett, who burst onto the scene in 1978 with his fiercely independent Killer of Sheep, returned in 1990 with his own story contingent upon escape, with To Sleep With Anger, following a family which tries to escape its troubled past. Now the past returns home to them in the form of Danny Glover's Harry. We meet the family as tensions, strife, and disagreements abound, with the youngest son being perpetually scolded. Then Harry comes to town, with his talk of gambling successes, mistreatment of women, and run-ins with the law, and other sordid tales the family thought they left behind. Such talk begins to seduce the younger son, and brings attention to the response to the escapist ending of many of these films. Where are you running to, anyway? The film seems to already have an answer. You can't just run away. The past can always try to lure you. Harry is just coming there like the boogeyman to make trouble. You know, in Jamaica they have a saying that he's full of crosses. All they're gonna do is bring you crosses. Or as Kane from Menace to Society might more bluntly put it when he's asked to flee to Georgia, Ain't nothing gonna change in Atlanta. I mean, I'm still gonna be black. This idea of escape, or the inability to do so, from the black experience of being stuck in a personal hell is a key ingredient of black cinema, even as Burnett and Lee suggest that physical escape may be futile. Location in these movies is as detrimental as any antagonist, and it is in fact the character's immobility that is rendered so tangibly in the works of these filmmakers. The exodus of families in Devil in a Blue Dress, the travel south via public transport in Boys in the Hood, and A Rage in Harlem are two very important examples. The train is a running motif in Clockers. Strike, the protagonist played by Mekki Pfeiffer, has a large train set and a great affinity for trains, though he's ever only ridden the subway, Keitel tells him. The opening of Juice is filled with labyrinthian tracks that literally cut through neighborhoods the characters cannot escape from. Images of trains likewise flood a rage in Harlem, and the soundtrack of Boys in the Hood is a cacophony of airplanes, vehicles, and just noise. Literally the noise of others' mobility stifling the characters. Maddie Rich's Straight Out of Brooklyn sets its lead character, Dennis, on the path of crime in order to get out of the projects and straight out of Brooklyn. That's the American dream, Shirley. That's what my mother and father worked like dogs all their lives for. But again, where are these characters running to? A new beginning? A chance at a new identity? The films examine characters who are figuring out just who they are and want to be, rather than who they've been told they are by wider society. That so many of the heretofore discussed films fall into the category of crime or noir should be of no surprise to us, really. As critic Banthea Diwaria argues, noir serves as an ideal genre, its tropes easily redeployed to represent class conflict as well as, quote, black rage at white America. In doing so, Diaria claims this redeems blackness from its genre definition by recasting the relation between light and dark on the screen as a metaphor for making black people and their cultures visible. In a broader sense, black film noir is a light, as in daylight, cast on black people. As such, it is a daylight descending on a people still discovering their identities, a cinema both of discovery and creation, as well as dealing with the past. The Hughes Brothers' 1992 debut feature, Menace to Society, served as response to another black-made film from the 1990s, John Singleton's Boys in the Hood. In film school, they always say, write what you know. Mm -hmm. And what do I know? I know South Central Los Angeles. So I just started hanging out with Fatback and some of my old folks and then listening to um, NWA and, and ACE's album. And I said, I'm gonna make this movie, it's gonna be called Boys in the Hood. Not unlike Juice, Clockers, or Straight Out of Brooklyn, Boys is a tale of a young black man residing in hell, in this case, South Central, but it could be New York City or Chicago or any other urban American sprawl. 
who yearns for freedom and must break from his friends to achieve something like an escape. For Alan and Albert Hughes, this was all a bit too simple, as well as sentimental. Well, the story came from, actually when we were 15 years old, we, we thought of, the, you know, we want to do a movie about a, a gangster and the lifestyle of, of, a, of how a kid comes to be a gangster or a hustler or whatnot. And we were just frustrated with uh, the market, you know, what they were trying to portray as far as the streets, and we wanted to make something that we wanted to see and our friends wanted to see. They aim to set the record straight. What sets Menace apart and makes it monumental is the skill and precision with which the Hughes brothers dismantle the escape myth. It's a truly visionary work, a mix of style and gut-wrenching realism that at once aims at the upper echelons of pure cinema while also providing a powerful, albeit nihilistic, vision of the black experience. Menace plays like a boiling cauldron. We follow an inner-city teen, Kane, from childhood until he ceases to be. In fact, the film begins even earlier, opening on newsreel of the Watts riots of 65, in which the filmmakers suggest it is the environment that breeds such violent characters. The tragedy of Kane's fall, filmed in slow motion, with the soundtrack dropped out so that all that we hear is a low rumble, is the film's final act of fury. The most innocent gets shot, Sharik, Kane's friend who has found religion. The most wicked is left unscathed, Odog. And the circle of violence continues, represented by the revolving trike wheel of Jada Pinkett's son, witness to it all. After seeing the Hollywoodized version of Flight at the end of all these films, the Hughes brothers decided to illustrate that sometimes it's just too late. Sometimes you've come too far. The result is one of the most gut-wrenching scenes of street violence ever committed to film. The two films together also serve as an important step forward in the story of black filmmaking. John Singleton was fresh out of USC film school with a script he typed in their computer lab when Columbia Pictures took a chance on him. At 24, he was the youngest person ever nominated for the Best Director Academy Award, and the first African American to be nominated at all. The Hughes brothers made Menace to Society when they were only 20 years old. Indeed, Hollywood seemed to be starting to take a chance on young black filmmakers. The past is not only personified in violence, however. We all have a past we have to confront. In Malcolm D. Lee's The Best Man from 1999, Tay Diggs, as up-and-coming novelist Harper Stewart, is about to release his first book, a thinly disguised take on his life among his college friends and lovers. However, as opening as Harper is with his readers, he's not been so with his friends, who are reading his book through a stolen preview copy. Oh, he just had some very relatable characters. Um, and it was a very American story. Everybody loved seeing wedding movies. And, you know, I think it just happened to be something that was very universal, but also had cultural specificity to it. And I think that's what, you know, made an, an, a very starving audience very happy to see themselves represented on screen. Throughout the picture, Harper will try to keep people from decoding the book's ultimate secret, an illicit affair with his best friend's fiance. The book embeds itself into the marital weekend in much the same way that Harry settles in with the family into sleep with anger, or in the way Bishop's criminal schemes dictate Q's chance at DJ stardom in Juice. What we've done, these films seem to say, dictates what we may be able to do, and it is in confronting these people, places, and things that these characters may achieve some semblance of growth or freedom. No escape needed. In 1991, Julie Dash became the first African-American woman to have a theatrically distributed film in the United States with her Daughters of the Dust. So it's the eve of the family's migration north and the women of the family who are the carriers of the family's traditions and beliefs uh, are arguing among themselves about uh, who goes north and who stays home and why. And I think that is a pretty universal subject about growth and change within a family. Daughters depicts three generations of a family in coastal South Carolina, and again concerns itself with past and geography, as the film follows a young member of the family who wants to move to the mainland and away from their traditional bound community. This boom of pictures in the 1990s also served an inspiration both to up and coming artists and others already in the game. Reginald Hudlin's 1992 film Boomerang on the surface seems like a fun romantic comedy, albeit one that may play as sexist in today's climate. Yeah, did not age the best, but further explores the issues of African American identity and art. Eddie Murphy and Robin Givens head a marketing firm, employed seemingly with only African Americans. The film continues both the quest for identity and confrontation with the past. 
Murphy's marketing executive is responsible for bringing together black art to draw black commerce, concocting marketing campaigns that speak to and for the black individual. He is, in a sense, through his work, finding a black identity. Viewed through this lens, one can see this mainstream comedy aiming to coexist and contribute to the burgeoning black cinema of the times. In his review for Boomerang, Roger Ebert noted how Eddie Murphy, with no filming competition, had attended the Keynes Film Festival premiere of Boys in the Hood and led in the cheering after the screening. Ebert kindly wondered what he was doing there in the first place and surmised perhaps that he was, quote, seeking out new influences to direct his career. Boomerang is a movie that looks backwards and forwards at this moment in time. In a quick cameo, he casts Melvin Van Peebles as an editor on one of his campaign spots. Van Peebles' Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song ushered in a new wave in black cinemas during the 1970s, and his Watermelon Man, about a white racist who one day wakes up black, fun, inspired the title for the first film to be directed by a black lesbian, 1996's The Watermelon Woman. Notice also how Murphy attempts to take Robin Givens on a date to an event for the Black Filmmakers Project, an institution thanked in the film's closing credits. There are more connective tissues than simply the color of the filmmakers that connect the dark noir of Menace and Juice to the romantic escapades of The Best Man and Boomerang. It is a quest for identity, not only in life, but in art too. Listen, I want to do something with my life, all right? I want to be somebody. Will Greaves, the 1970s documentarian, coined the term mental enslavement, calling it, quote, the passive wholesale acceptance of white middle class values by blacks. While the Hughes brothers are telling the audience what is real, so to speak, so too are Malcolm D. Lee and Reginald Hudlin, who are liberating other byways and avenues of the black experience. If Clocker shows characters leaving home in search of new beginnings, and to sleep with anger is an attempt at such new beginnings, then the best man and Boomerang pave the way for a new black experience, when the running is finally finished. The ending of Devil in a Blue Dress may represent the moment when the character ceases to run and finally stakes a claim for himself. Easy, Denzel Washington, settles down for a talk and a drink with a pal, and soon he says, and I forgot all about Daphne Monet, D. with Albright, Carter, and them. And I sat with my friend on my porch at my house. And we laughed a long time. While black filmmaking of the 1990s did appear to have a singular topic on its mind, it was much more than a single-minded moment. Just Another Girl on the IRT takes on unwanted pregnancies, Eve's Bayou chronicles a fraudulent existence, Waiting to Exhale explores friendship and love. Still, as New Jack City and Boys in the Hood became hit films, and hip-hop artists began rising to cross-cultural fame, filmmaker Rusty Kundif noticed a tendency of the times, and he confronted it in perhaps the best way, through slapstick comedy. Taking the framework of This Is Spinal Tap, turning metal into rap music, and calling it Fear of a Black Hat. This mockumentary chronicles the rap group NWH Rap Music, which gave rise and voice to a people that often studied the work of fictional white gangsters. It quickly became the art form that proved vital to a large part of the identity and personhood emerging among African Americans during this period. Kandif riffed on the NWA story, along other rap acts, and also created the catch-all hybrid of a black filmmaker he calls Jake Spingleton. I had the hat before you did, I had the glasses before you did, and I was short before you were. Labeled as a black auteur, Jake represents something both refreshing and current in that Hollywood moment, while also at a more mm, subtle level insinuating how the black auteur could be boiled down to a NWH. That Cundiff created the representation of the black director with a few pieces of clothing and his diminutive stature suggests that this black auteur was perhaps created? Concocted? Allowed? Not legitimate entirely? Other problematics here are twofold. Writer, director, and star Rusty Cundiff acknowledges the particular narrative that rap in early 90s cinema is providing. For every analysis of a tale in which a black man's freedom is taking the law into his own hands, there's also a tale where we see a young black man with, well, a gun. As Cundiff observed the cinema of the 1990s creating entertainment out of real-life tragic inspirations, he decided to take things to their zany conclusion, having NWH rapper Tasty Taste, once 6'4", involved in a bazooka incident which decreases his height by a foot. Look at him, man! Huh? Just look at him! He was six foot! Before we get While Kundif riffed on this catch-all personification of a black filmmaker, other filmmakers couldn't help but realize the reality of the joke. Matty Rich pointed out as early as 1992, the problem is the door is already closing. 
These filmmakers from last year are in, but it's not open for many newcomers. There can't be too many of us. The system isn't designated for us to be very dominant. This statement proved too prophetic for filmmakers such as Julie Dash, who after releasing Daughters of the Dust to critical acclaim and being nominated for the Grand Jury Prize at the 1991 Sundance Film Festival, which is not too shabby, was unable to find financing for a follow-up feature and proceeded to work in television, which is just kind of bonkers. Those who made the cut had varied careers over the following decades, sometimes in black cinema, whatever that meant at the time, and sometimes clearly not. Some were able to overcome and confront the label though. Alan Hughes said, We resented the fact that every time we got into an interview, they would ask us about John or Spike like we were all the same people. And Western culture tends to look at black people as all the same. I don't think we need to label us a new wave of black cinema, it's just cinema. We're all gonna tell stories. Luckily, black creators did not stop making films of various content. Perhaps Kandif would two years later find F. Gary Gray's Friday most refreshing. Written by Ice Cube and DJ Pooh, the film is content to hang out with its protagonists, who themselves are content to do little at all, other than simply be. Not that black filmmakers were not aware of the ground that they tread. Charles Burnett admitted that he, as well as his peers, did have a consciousness of this thing called black cinema. We would shut down restaurants, and the debate was, who was making black films? And we couldn't define what a black film was, but we kinda knew it when we saw it. Luckily, over the past few years, what a black film is has grown and broadened, and with the aid of the victorious Oscar grab for 2016's Moonlight, There was a time when I, when I thought this movie was impossible because I couldn't, I couldn't bring it to fruition. I couldn't bring myself to tell another story. And so everybody behind me on the stage said, no, that is not acceptable. In Ava DuVernay's US Dramatic Directing Award win at Sundance in 2012, from middle of nowhere, the film industry seems willing to fund new stories. But what we should really be picking up on are the unique voices and tales displayed in films such as Dope, Moonlight, Blind Spotting, Sorry to Bother You, and Get Out, just to name a few. But there's much progress still to be made. It wasn't until 2019 with Matty Diop's Atlantiques that a black woman director screened at the Cannes Film Festival. Individuals who have managed to thrive in the current industry are also doing their part. Producer Will Packer, who's been creating avenues into the film industry from as far back as the days of blockbuster video, and is known for such films as Girls Trip and Straight Outta Compton, has partnered with NBC Universal and Target to create the Scene in Color film series, which produces short films from rising black artists that will air on NBC stations, as well as streamers such as Peacock. As part of Packer and NBC's commitment, they'll be providing these artists with mentorship and script deals. The series undertakes exhaustive research of forums and online film festivals to discover untapped BIPOC creatives that may very well be important future voices of the arts. You know, the next generation coming up, I do like for them to see yeah. that it's not just about being in front of the camera, not just about being an actor or mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. rapper, you know, in entertainment um, in front of the camera. There are a lot of folks making moves behind the camera and not enough of them look like me. Right, so I do want people to know there's an opportunity to be down there and be a real mover and shaker and power broker behind the scenes. Rather than look back and view this as simply another moment or another movement, perhaps we as viewers should permit these creators room to tell the stories they wish to tell in the way they wish to tell them. They are by far the freshest voices and most creative minds at work today. And as Jordan Peele proclaimed, I don't see myself casting a white dude as the lead in my movie. Not that I don't like white dudes, but I've seen that movie. Rather than try to label these disparate voices as one, maybe we should let each speak for itself and be grateful we are perhaps at a place where we can finally begin to hear them without the filter of genre label. When we don't consider ourselves uh, black filmmakers, we consider ourselves filmmakers who are black. Yeah. And we might tell black stories and that we might tell them the rest of the way, but we're still filmmakers first. And that's our video. Thanks for listening, Tonglers.